okay this is video lecture on chapter 4 how to estimate and classify costs last week we looked at estimating and increasing revenues now this is estimating and classifying costs now here we are dealing with the operations branch because cost is the language that operational management and supply chain management speaks the four accounting concepts first is cost identification second is cost classification then we have cost management and finally payback period okay let's take one at a time cost identification why is it difficult to identify costs see in revenues identifying revenues was not difficult we obviously knew the source of revenues it was estimating the demand and therefore estimating the revenues that was a challenge but when it comes to cost even just identifying the cost becomes difficult why is it identifying costs are more difficult than identifying revenues because the passion of entrepreneurs often blind them to hidden costs that they, they are so passionate about the idea that they they just blinded to to costs that they don't even see it so how do we overcome this is a production plan what is a production plan a production plan is a pictorial description of supplies of how supplies are received assets are used to convert inputs into outputs products and services are delivered to customers and finally the money is collected from customers so here is what we will do on Thursday is you would here is a pictorial description of the various activities market survey and t-shirt design registering the business then plain t-shirts made in Mexico shipped here so you think through the various activities it's going to take for us to be able to sell game specific t-shirts here in Syracuse on game days but then what these activities this pictorial description of activities allow us to do it sensitizes us to cost so these costs some of them at least it tend to be hidden so to kind of see them this pictorial description this production plan this activity chart helps us okay so we come back this production plan will help identify many costs as possible when you listen to this video on supply chain management visualize your own production flow chart and list as many activities and cost as applicable to your organization okay so let's go to this video let's take a simple product like a bottle of water clean water a plastic bottle a plastic cap and a label. Buying them at the store or vending machine might cost you about a dollar fifty. How much of that do you think is profit? Nope. Wrong. Wrong again. Not likely. Water. A plastic bottle and a label. That couldn't cost more than fifty cents. And if you buy them in bulk, how could each bottle not give you at least a dollar in profit? Seriously. If you think you can make $1 per bottle, you should drop out of college right now and get into the bottled water business. You see, this right here illustrates one of the most common consumer misconceptions. Product cost is not equal to material cost. And in business, you don't have the luxury of thinking only as a consumer. You need to think like a business executive, or better yet, an entrepreneur. So, in order to figure out where all that profit went, we need to imagine what it took for that bottle of water to get into your hands. First, you need to negotiate the purchase of the empty bottles and caps. Those bottles will be much easier to transport if they're in boxes. We'll need to shrink wrap those bottles so they don't fall out of the box. We can move a whole lot of boxes quickly if they're all put on pallets. In order to move the pallets, you'll need a forklift, which means you'll need a forklift driver. 
That forklift will then take the pallet and put it into a truck, which will require a truck, driver, fuel, and insurance. Also, you'll need a label for that bottle of water. Therefore, you need to design the label, print the label, and get the label shipped to the plant. Another truck, driver, more fuel, and insurance. Our water bottling plant won't be free, and neither will the energy it uses. In our bottling plant, we'll have employees and bottling machines, and let's not forget the day-to-day -day items like light bulbs, garbage bags, machine parts, janitorial supplies, toilet paper, and anything else that will be used at the plant by the employees. Oh yeah, and we'll also need access to the drinking water. Machines will then purify the water, other machines will bottle the water and affix the labels to the bottles. And still, another set of machines will box, shrink wrap, and then palletize the bottles. In order to move those pallets, again, you'll need a forklift, which means we'll need another forklift driver. That forklift will then take the pallets and put them into trucks headed to the distribution centers. And, as we've seen, those trucks will require drivers, fuel, and insurance. Those distribution centers will also require employees, forklifts, and energy. From the distribution center, they'll head out to retail stores on still another truck, which will require a driver, fuel, and insurance. That store will need employees to unload the truck, stock the bottles of water on the shelf or refrigerator. If you have a refrigerator, you'll of course need energy. If we want to secure our stock, we may get a security guard or a security system. And of course, the store will likely get insurance. Also, imagine the costs associated with returning and replacing bottles that are damaged. Oh, and for some reason, even bottles of water sometimes have 1-800 numbers, which means you'll need a staffed call center to answer the customer's questions about your bottle of water. Wow! All those materials, boxes, people, machines, buildings, energy, fuel, and vehicles, they cost money. Those things weren't free and they probably weren't used efficiently, and it's likely that several bottles didn't survive the journey to the consumer. Oh, and by the way, the employees at the water company, you know, the ones that work in finance, accounting, marketing, human resources, and IT, they want a paycheck too. So, through that simple example of a super simple product, we're beginning to see that companies face challenges when they buy things, make things, move things, sell things, and service things, which includes repair and maintenance. All right, so that uh, video hopefully uh, illustrates to you even a simple product like a bottle of water, there are so many costs that tends to skip our minds and so which is true of your business as well so that's why drawing uh, activity chart sensitizes us okay let's take the first question or first question on cost identification which of the following statements about cost is not true costs are less important than revenues is that true or not true identifying costs are more difficult than identifying revenues true not true a production plan is helpful in identifying costs estimating revenues are more difficult than estimating costs post the video and see what your answer will be The correct answer is A. Costs are less important than revenues? No, I mean they're both equally important. Finally, profits is what you're looking for and it's revenues minus costs. But identifying costs are more difficult than identifying revenues. That is true. And uh, estimating costs is easier, but spotting, identifying the costs is more difficult. The production plan is helpful in identifying costs. On the other hand, estimating revenues, particularly the demand, is more difficult than estimating. So the difference between identifying the name of a cost or name a source of a revenue and then estimating it. When it comes to identifying, 
identifying costs, all possible costs are more difficult. Once you identify estimation, cost is not that difficult. You make a couple of phone calls and do some Google search to find out what the estimate of an identified cost would be. Okay, so A is the correct answer. It's not true. So it's not true that costs are less important than revenues. Okay, then we go to cost classification. Once we identify and we estimate, then we need to classify. Or we identify, classify, then estimate. How are costs classified? First note, costs are classified into operational costs and startup costs. What's the difference? Startup costs are costs that a firm incurs only once when starting its business. So you, you got to start, you got to buy the equipment and you got to do the legal paperwork and and uh, so so at the st at the st starting up of a business there are a lot of one time only costs that's a startup cost in contrast operational costs are costs that a firm incurs every year after you started production when you are go you started your operations every year like rent you got to pay every year material costs you got to buy materials every year so you basically ask, is this a one time only, only at the beginning, startup cost? Is it something that's going to repeat itself every year when operations, after operations have begun? That's operational cost. Okay, and now you see the startup costs are further classified into startup expenses and long term assets. So let's get into that now. Why only some startup costs are treated as long term assets? and others as initial expenses. Only the startup costs that bring future cash flows and can be resold. Now why do we incur some startup costs? Because those equipment, those patent that we got or those legal expenses we incurred, all of that is setting us up to generate future cash flows. But some of those they have no future value. They cannot be resold. Once you spent it, it's gone. And so in that case, only those that can be resold, that has a future value, even though that value may come down, are treated as long-term assets. For example, we buy a logo printing machine. The logo printing machine <coughs> can be resold in future. So it is a long-term asset. The reduction in resale value of assets is expensed as depreciation each year. The value doesn't remain the same. The more you use it, the value comes down. So that reduction in the value of the asset is called depreciation. I'm sure you've heard this term. And uh, the conservatism principle, this is one of the gap principles, which basically says you better to be safe than sorry. That, that whenever uh, you are not sure of something, then be safe. Don't, don't overstate your assets or don't overstate your income because outsiders pay attention to those two numbers. Right? So conservatism principles, principle requires that other startup costs be treated as initial operational expense in the first year itself. So like our legal costs. So, I mean, we cannot... We have to incur that cost up front, but I mean, you cannot sell that down the line. So then it says, okay, it's initial expense. Some, there may be a little bit of a question. Can we, can we not? And, but, but it says, when you're in doubt, treat it as, as an initial expense in the first year itself. Okay, so it's only those that have a clear resale value will be treated as long-term assets. And what are some examples of long-term assets? Land. But note that land generally appreciates in value. They don't depreciate. But again, due to conservatism principle, the value appreciation is not recognized until the land is sold. Because it's very difficult to tell, well, by how much has it appreciated. And people can start to play game, so, so we don't go there. And uh, 
So only when you are selling, we say, yeah, you bought it for 200,000, you sold it for 350, there is a profit of 150,000. Another long-term asset is building. Now buildings can be costly. As such, it is better to rent a space than to construct one when evaluating the profitability of your business. So some of you, if you need a building, don't think about constructing it. It will, it will become a nightmare to estimate the construction cost. And, uh, but think about renting. You know, you rent a uh, building, you can do some remodeling and, and, and to see whether your business would be profitable and is, is my advice. But buildings, of course, depreciate in value and we show depreciation. Equipment. This is what every business is almost certain to require. All of you will have uh, need for some equipment and it has to be depreciated every year to recognize reduction in value. Okay, so these are examples of long-term assets. What are some examples of initial expenses, startup expenses that couldn't be treated as long-term assets? Initial promotional costs, research and development costs, right? and uh, design costs, you know, doing web design. Now this is one of those things, maybe you could sell that website, but conservatism principle comes and says, just just treat it, you know, you're not sure whether there will be a market value for that or not. Remodeling costs, legal costs, training costs, travel costs, those trips that we will take to Mexico to identify suppliers, any consultation costs, and you could think of other costs that applies to you. Okay, now we come back. Remember we said costs are classified into startup costs and operational costs. So we saw startup costs are further classified into long-term assets and startup expenses. Now we come to operational costs, these costs that repeat itself, like rent, like materials. Now they are going to be classified into variable cost and fixed costs. Okay. Why some operational costs are variable and others fixed? Some operational costs, for example materials, vary with changing demand, while other costs, for example rent, do not vary with changing demand. So let's come here to our chapter 3. So you would see that our target demand was 20,000, but first year 80% of it was 16, then 90% was 18. So demand changed from 16, 18, then a steady state of 20. We've hit our target. Now some cause, when demand changes, changes like this, the cost will also change and increase. For example, material cost. The more t-shirts we sell in the second year, then, then you know, the more material and or at least the more t-shirts we need to buy from Mexico and the cost is going to increase, third year is going to increase more. But look at rent. Well, rent in each, in each year, whether it's 16 or 18 or 20, you're going to pay the same rent, $1,500 a month for the, the store in Marshall Square. Uh, so, so, you see, rent then becomes a fixed cost because it does not change with changing demand. So this is the thinking you need to do. After you know that something is an operational cost, you say, hey, in my first three years, do, as my demand increased, do I expect this cost to go up? It's variable. No, it's the fixed, then it's fixed cost. Okay. And uh, so, let's go further. What are some examples of variable and fixed cost? variable cost per unit, cost of materials is variable, inventories, supplies, because the more units you sell, you're going to need more. Direct labor costs, those people, direct labor is the those who directly touch the product and work, those who are going to package, the, those who are going to print the logos and credit charges and selling sales commissions and Note that the total variable cost may change, 
but per unit on every unit we pay a flat fee to the Mexico for a t-shirt so we cannot express total variable cost because that's going to change every year but we could talk about variable cost per unit that remains the same and that's how we will express our variable cost fixed cost per year rent the routine promotion that we do every year note the fixed cost variable classification applies only to operational costs, not, not, not to the startup cost. So routine promotion is operational. You, you spend a flat fee, it doesn't matter the, how many units that you're going to sell. The insurance costs, IT related costs. Now, there are some costs that are going to be mixed. There is a fixed portion and a variable portion. If you think about your utility bill, there'll be a flat fee. It doesn't matter whether how much your usage was, then based on your usage. Similarly, there is something called step fixed cost. Say that in a business you're, you're conducting some tournaments, you, you buy one trophy for every 10 participants in a tournament. So up to 10 participants, you buy only one trophy, let's say that's $18. But when you go from 10 11 to 20 then you need two trophies then the cost is going to be 36 then from 21 to 30 44 so this is called the step fixed cost so you may have a mixed cost where there is a fixed component and a variable component or you may have step fixed cost what do you do in both cases is you break them up into a fixed and variable portion and I will show this uh, in in class as well so then we you know put the mixed fixed portion with a fixed cost and the variable portion with a variable cost okay let's stop and think which of the following statements is true about long-term assets which of the following statement is true about long-term assets right and one of the startup costs and uh, and and it can be, yeah long-term assets are part of operational costs is that true long-term assets are variable costs firms should seek to minimize their long-term assets long-term assets can be resold pause the video and take a minute and see which one is true is a true statement the correct answer is D let's see because we know only the startup costs that can be resold we consider them as long-term assets why is this not true long-term assets are part of startup cost not operational cost long-term assets are no only only operational costs are classified into variable and fixed so this doesn't even apply firms should seek to minimize their long-term assets no and we will study this later in cost management you don't want to go into minimizing that because you need some long-term assets but you you seek to manage but not the manage the relationship between cost and value not try to minimize because then you don't buy the good quality equipment and then you would run into trouble but long-term assets can be resold that is true okay cost management so should firms seek to minimize their costs like that question said should firms seek to minimize their long-term assets offering products and services necessarily require the consumption of costly resources seeking to minimize cost therefore may not always be a good idea because it may lead to lowering the value lowering the value example quality of the products or services because if, if you see revenues we try to maximize but costs you don't try to minimize because then you may try to cut corners and buy the cheapest machine and low quality t-shirts and then the customers may not buy it so we don't we don't do that then what then should firms seek with respect to their costs? firms should seek to manage the relationship 
between organizational costs and customer valuation right and you see okay if I incur these costs am I creating more value to customers so then you do a cost benefit is costing me so much how much more value will I be able to increase my price will I be able to sell more units and then you do the cost benefit they they should seek to eliminate or minimize only non value added cost you find something you are incurring this cost but it doesn't add any more value to the customers for example let's say you need a laptop I mean a $600 laptop may get the job done but now if you go and spend $2,000 on a laptop but you don't need all the fancy features in that $2,000 your customer is not going to see any benefit of that additional cost so that's a non-value added cost that going from that, that your laptop is needed but a $2,000 laptop is not needed then you you try to minimize that you know stick with the 600 but on the other hand this $2,000 laptop has features that 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 you can use to improve your product or service that customers value yeah then it makes it worthwhile how does operational and supply chain management help firms manage their costs Operational management analyzes and improves the organizational process that converts inputs, which are the resources, into outputs, the goods and services. Supply chain management analyzes and improves the upstream flow of inputs. The inputs are coming from, su from suppliers and the downstream flow of outputs to customers managing well the operations and supply chain last week we studied about marketing management now operations management and supply chain management therefore may not always lower costs but will optimize customer value and minimize non-value added costs right? so here is a diagram so here is the operations of a firm there are inputs resources going into it and output is your product and service so operations management takes care of this you know this one and this one here and basically this conversion process now supply chain management comes and says wait a minute these inputs are coming from some suppliers and we need to manage this also for example if they don't if they're not delivering on time and laborers are ready machines are ready but inputs didn't come or they come and they are of substandard quality well that's that's really going to <coughs> mess up the the even though you may have a very good operational management but if you didn't manage the supply chain or you produce things these things later you're producing something to sell during the Christmas season but it got delayed and then the holiday period is over and if it's going to reach the customers later I mean you're, go you're going to incur a lot of cost so you got to manage this upstream flow of inputs downstream flow of output that's called supply chain management okay which of the following is not true about supply chain management SEM or supply chain management seeks on time arrival of inputs supply chain management seeks longer term relationships with suppliers supply chain management efficiently converts inputs into outputs supply chain management seeks timely delivery of outputs to customers take a minute pause the video the correct answer is C because it is operational management that focuses on converting inputs into output supply chain focuses on the upstream flow of inputs downstream flow of outputs so the other three are true about supply chain okay and um, so let's come to payback period the fourth concept how does cash flow in and out of an organization so now let's uh, put the three and four and focus on the flow of cash 
cash flows out initially to cover the various startup costs. Remember, whether it's long term assets or initial expense, legal bills, uh, logo printing machine. Okay, so uh, initially cash flows out for these various startup costs. Then cash flows in eventually. You know, first year you may not, the business may not bring money, but eventually. Uh, when the operation has become profitable cash flows in in early years cash flow may be lower even negative due to lower demand every firm wants to ensure that cash flow from operations over the years when the money starts coming back is higher than what went out initially so what is a payback period then payback period is the number of years it takes to recover that initial startup cost. Payback period is a quick indicator of a firm's profitability. Firms like to see a low payback period because they want to quickly recover their costs. Then after that everything that comes after is profits. On the other hand, we need to be careful when we are estimating costs. A low estimated payback period could also be the result of underestimating costs. Remember, entrepreneurs are blinded to cost. Or you overestimate at the target demand or both. Right? So we will do this in this week's homework. We, we want your payback period initially to be four years or more because most of the time students tend to ignore cost and so that payback period condition allows you to go back and increase your startup costs or operational costs and so you're not being unreasonable in your estimates. Which of the following is not true about the payback period? Payback period is the number of years it takes to pay back the startup costs. Remember, you're looking for not true. Firms like to see a longer payback period. The greater the startup cost, the longer the payback period. The greater the demand, the shorter the payback period. Post the video and see what is the correct answer with respect to payback period, which is not true. The correct answer is B, in the sense that firms like to see a shorter payback period. They want a quick, they want a quick payback. Others are true. Payback period is a number of years it takes to pay back the startup cost. Greater the startup cost, if you have a lot of money to recover, it's going to take more payback period. But the greater the demand, if you're selling a lot, then money is going to come faster, shorter the payback period. So the correct answer or what is not true is B. Okay, And uh, then your, we will talk about this in the other video. You 4.1, the Excel, and 4.2.